Dear Lord, save us from hardness of heart and wandering of mind as we approach your holy altar and the sacraments which you give to us. May we be fed and then serve in your name. Amen. Please rise for the opening hymn. Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Beloved God, as we approach your presence, guide and stir us with your Holy Spirit that we may become one body, one spirit in Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. <laughs>
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God in Christ, you have revealed your glory among the nations. Preserve the works of your mercy, that your church throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in the confession of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of Scripture. A reading from the book of Job. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and ye shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Can you lift up your voices, voice to the clouds so that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings so that they may go and say to you, here we are. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to number the clouds? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and the clods sing, cling together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their covert? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. you have 
reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but only takes it when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also, Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. 
But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Here's your word of the day. The Odyssey. The Odyssey. In the philosophy of religion, a theodicy is an argument that attempts to resolve the problem of evil that arises when, and all, when all power and all goodness are simultaneously ascribed to God. If God is all good and all powerful, how can bad things in the world happen, especially to the righteous? There are two categories of evil that must be considered, moral evil and natural evil. Moral evil is when people treat each other wrongly. Murder, robbery, internet harassment, or state-sanctioned reigning of artillery on innocent citizens. Natural evil is when the creation causes random harm to innocents. Hurricane victims in North Carolina, a million Americans dead to COVID-19. How do you account for evil in the world while believing in an all-powerful, benevolent God? The worldwide pandemic changed so much. I lost my mother and my father-in-law to the virus. I suppose many of you lost someone close. It changed how we worship. We don't touch each other in church these days. For some seniors, touching at church is their primary physical contact. School-aged kids lost so much educationally and developmentally, but we adapted. The workplace was transformed from office coffee clutches to the ubiquitous Zoom meeting. I love Zoom. The very notion of being part of a group when we cannot gather in person. With Zoom, I can sit in my garage and make the background blurred and nobody knows what I'm doing. My wife, Lynn, is a regular Zoomer. Another consequence of the pandemic was a change in the way we entertain ourselves at home while we could not venture forth in safety. 
Enter Netflix. How many of you watch Netflix? All right, choir. Yep, there we go. Hands are up. A lot of Netflix programming is made of multi-episode stories. I confess to a lot of couch behavior known as binge watching. Sitting through five separate hour-long episodes at a single setting. I still love Netflix and BritBox, and occasionally I still binge. Today's Old Testament lesson from the book of Job is like turning on episode four of a five episode Netflix story. It has enough material to stand alone, but you know that you're missing the broader context. You feel like you must go back to episode one and watch the whole thing. So, here is my Netflix cliff note version of the book of Job. The book of Job is not an easy read unless you are an English lit major. It is 90% poetry. Also, and most annoyingly, it asks one question over and over again and it never answers it. Why do bad things happen to good people? The epilogue offers a happy ending, which is very dissatisfying to lovers of Irish and Russian literature, where there's never a happy ending for the protagonist. But what the book of Job will do is take you to a more profound place than you intended. Here we go, episode one. God grants his prosecuting attorney petition against a righteous man. The story opens with a prologue propounding the virtue of our hero, Job. He is righteous, blameless in everything. Proof of his goodness is that Job is uber rich, the richest in the land. His 10 children are also rich. Good guy, good dad, faithful to God. Vote for Job. The scene shifts to the heavenly court where God recounts God's, Job's goodness, rather, to all present. But one rises in objection, Satan. Satan isn't some figure with horns. No, Satan is Hebrew for prosecutor or accuser. If you are unfortunate enough to be hauled into an Israeli courtroom today, the prosecutor is indeed called Satan. I love it. God's district attorney objects that the only reason Job is just is because you, God, keep rewarding him for being so. He is the richest man in his country. So of course he honors you and toes the line. Let me have Adam and you'll see that he is no better than the rest. God grants his DA's petition and allows him to cause Job any and all suffering as long as no hand is laid upon Job. Job's notion of justice is about to be tested by virtue of suffering. End of episode one. We are hooked. Time to microwave the popcorn and settle in. Episode two. It's action-packed, but unsettling. Job under siege. Job, at the hand of Satan, allowed by God, experiences horrible human suffering. In the course of but a few days, the Sabaeans attack and steal all of Job's oxen and donkeys and kill a portion of his servants. 
Fire falls from the sky, burning up his sheep and killing more of his servants. Next, the Chaldeans attack and steal Job's camels, killing yet more of his servants. No sooner than receiving this terrible report, another runner arrives with worse news. A mighty wind has swept in from the desert, destroying the house where all your children were gathered for a birthday celebration. They are all dead. So there you have it. Moral and natural evil falling on righteous Job. Job's response is twofold. He tears his robe and shaves his head as an act of mourning. And then he worships God, uttering these words from Scripture that you've probably heard. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Satan is annoyed with Job's noble response to suffering and requests God's permission to up the ante and have a direct attack against Job's person. Permission is granted. So Satan afflicts Job with painful sores from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. The pain is so great that Job wallows in the dust and tries to scrape off his sores using broken pieces of pottery. End of episode two. Time for bathroom break. This is intense. Episode three, friendly counsel arrives. A reprieve. Job's first counsel is from her, his wife. She's lost all her children, her family's wealth, and now her husband's health. Her suggestion? Just curse God and die. That's the quote. Job rebukes her. You're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Is there a hint of misogyny and patriarchy here? Then arrive three friends who try to help him make sense of the suffering. This is the bulk of the book of Job. After sitting with him in silence, they try to explain the situation. It gets reduced to the following. God is just. Job is suffering. Therefore, Job has done something wrong to merit his malfortune. They then proceed to imagine what wrongs he may have committed. What friends, huh? God is justly punishing Job for secret sins, or maybe even for sins unknown. The problem is, God has already said that Job is indeed innocent. He has done no wrong. Their wisdom isn't adequate for his circumstances. Job grew up believing in the simple principle of retributive justice, where each person gets what he or she deserves, suffering for the evil and prosperity for the good. But now he's suffering even though he's good. He's unable to change his worldview. He can't do the paradigm shift. But this much he can manage. He calls out God, claiming God is either A, incompetent, or B, disinterested. A 
fourth visitor appears and offers that suffering may be designed prophylactically to prevent against some greater future calamity, or perhaps serving as an example for others. This is the theory that while AIDS swept through the gay population in the United States 1980s, it actually averted millions of deaths in Africa through the development of medicines which otherwise would have never been created and manufactured. Not good enough, says Job, who ends the visits by demanding that God hear his case directly and in person. This is reminiscent of those dying in the Holocaust who held God at trial for the genocide taking place against them. Episode five, Job challenges God, God challenges Job. In episode four, God grants Job's demand. This is where we are today in our lesson. Speaking to Job directly in a whirlwind, he shows Job how vast and complex the universe is. God is very sharp with Job. Were you there when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that a flood of waters may cover you? God goes on at some length to show Job that, that he lacks wisdom to understand how the universe operates, that the universe is complex and dangerous. He invites Job. He actually invites Job to micromanage the universe for a single day, provided that Job uses the strict principle of retributive justice that Job had touted. Job will have to merit every bad deed its proper punishment and every good deed its proper reward in the world. Wisely, Job does not take up God's offer. The Almighty then reminds Job of two creatures, Behemoth and Leviathan. These mythological creatures are not evil, but neither are they safe. They symbolize disorder and danger. The point is that God's world is amazing and very good, but it is not perfect or always safe. God's world has order and beauty, but it is also wild and sometimes dangerous, just like those two creatures, Behemoth and Leviathan. The creation is not designed to prevent suffering. And that is God's response to Job. Our episode ends with Job acknowledging his foolishness, the foolishness of his complaint and his provincial perspective on justice. He repents and acknowledges that God is God and he, Job, is in no position to judge the Almighty. Job's task is to trust in God's wisdom and character. This is the storyline's great aha moment. I wish our Netflix show would have rolled credits right there. But the viewers wanted their hero, Job, to get more than wisdom. So in a short 17-verse epilogue, God restores Job's fortune. With 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen and eleven female donkeys, but there's more. Job gets seven new sons, 
three daughters and four generations of grandchildren. And if you're keeping score, yes, that's 20 children that Job's wife has birthed into the world. The final verse is illustrative. And Job died, an old man full of days. Roll credits. The Odyssey attempts to resolve the problem of evil that arises when all power and all goodness are simultaneously ascribed to God. This week, Lynn and I traveled in New York City for a large event designed to raise enough money to free a thousand children from slavery. Slavery is a moral evil with long tentacles. In the end, I have no resolution to the problem of evil. It is real and often devastating. But I can respond, not by demanding retributive justice, an eye for an eye, but restorative justice, being an agent of hope and God's mercy in the world. Jesus began his earthly ministry quoting Isaiah. Now, today, is the acceptable time to free the captives, to welcome the prisoners, the stranger, to care for widows and orphans, and bring hope to the oppressed. Today, Jesus said, this is fulfilled in your hearing. This is how we are to serve God's very good, but not perfect creation, as moral agents for goodness and mercy. Anything else, anything less, is adding to humanity's misery and the creation's disorder and chaos. Want to participate? I hope so. Amen. Please stand as you're able. And let us affirm the faith of the church through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God. The Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God and God. To God, to God, one to Him all things For us, as far as salvation, we can be now and ever. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we became part of the Virgin Mary. Amen. For our sins, was crucified in the conscious Pilate. He suffered death.
As we pray for the church in our world, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, please put your own thanksgivings and intercessions in the comments section. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord saying, guide us in your love and grace. God of all creation, you are present in the whole universe, even in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace all that exists with tenderness and love. Pour out upon us the power of your love so that we are so moved to embrace the world you give us with tenderness. God of all creation, guide us in your love and grace. Lord, our teacher, teach us to discover the worth of your creation, both great and small, to be filled with awe, wonder, and contemplation, and to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature. Help the leaders of your church to be examples of that oneness in their lives and ministry. God of all creation, guide us in your love and grace. Lord of all wisdom and understanding, as water floods or runs dry, so that seeds cannot grow and bear fruit, as the land can no longer flourish, as the temperatures of our world rise, as ice melts and the sea levels rise, we pray you to touch the hearts of those of us who have forsaken your creation for our own gain and false prosperity and for the complicity of all, that we may hear and respond to the groaning of the earth's adversity. God of all creation, guide us in love and grace. Lord of all power and light, we pray you to enlighten those of us with power and wealth, that we do not turn away in indifference, but rather come to use and share that power and wealth for the common good, for the care of the poor, and for the care of all creation. God of all creation, <coughs> Lord of all peoples, languages, and cultures, we thank you for giving us diversity in both nature and humanity. We at St. Barnabas remember the native peoples on whose homeland we now worship. We pray for forgiveness for any complicity in ill treatment of native peoples and seek to be united in ways that promote the well-being of all. God of all creation, Lord of healing and mercy, we give thanks for your love and all that you give to us. We pray you now to care especially for people who suffer, either from consequences of war, strife, famine, and ill health, or for any other reasons. We continue to pray for those in our own community, Gary and Leslie, Phyllis Porter, Angela, Shirley, Aaron, Rebecca, no, Anthony's in Bosnia, Tim, Anna, Carrie, Emmett Cole, Rico Carlos, Jason and Justin, Envoy, Miranda and Jim, Benjamin, the Solos family, Anthony, Cynthia, Richard and Connie and Matthew. And we pray for those who have died especially the late Ebert. God of all creation, guide us in love And now from the bidding book, we pray for healing for Debbie, healing for Bill Grenick, healing for Gary T, healing, peace and comfort for Ernie, repose of soul for Martin Marin, and comfort for his family. We pray for healing for Richard R. and for peace. We pay for addition and depression of Cynthia S. We pray that Matthew may stay free from drugs. 
We pray for Richard and Connie for healing from cancer. We pray for healing from the, for the Solo family, healing for Benjamin and Miranda for healing and sobriety. We pray for healing for Ernest Cole, sobriety and family healing for Rico, healing for Jason and Justin. May the baby that turns from breech birth for Alexis. We pray for healing for inner ear, nausea, and equilibrium problems for Jessica. We pray for healing for Shelley, healing for Amy for surgery on Monday, and other prayers for Priscilla. Do we have anything on Facebook Live? Yes, from Facebook Live, we have a few. We have healing for Corrine Seely, for Julie, and for Marianne. God of all creation, guide us in your power and grace. Almighty God, to whom we must account for all our powers and privileges, guide the people of the United States in the election of officials and representatives, that by faithful administration and wise laws, the rights of all may be protected and our nation be enabled to fulfill your purposes. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God. Please be seated. Before the vestry member shares her announcements for you, uh, as I mentioned, Lynn and I, we're going to be off uh, in uh, New York City, and we're just coming in as a congregation to stewardship time, so I get to say something right now. It's not planned. Nelson Rockefeller, when he died, he was the richest man in the United States, lived in New York City. His accountant was asked the question, how much did he leave behind? And the accountant answered, all of it. <laughs> Folks, you can't take it with you. I'm a deep believer in the tithe. I'm a deep believer in plan giving. Consider these things. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Tracy Shiro. I'm your best on call this morning. I just wanted to draw your attention to page two of our bulletin. There's lots of things happening um, in the notable events. Um, a few things I just wanted to highlight. Um, this coming Saturday, October 26, is the memorial for Janice's mom, Gladys Johnson, and it's at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, also on Sunday, November 3rd, um, it is our pledge card gathering and also our gratitude brunch. And Robert, it's my understanding you're going to take the lead on that, but we're asking that um, anyone who plans on attending sign up um, on the list and plan to bring a side dish, um, either a salad or a side dish or a dessert. Is that right? If you're called to. If you're called to. Okay, but we would um, love to um, <laughs> participate. Um, also, um, just wanted to take a moment 
deep breathe and our roof is nearly done. Um, all the work that's been happening on the roof is nearly done and we just have all of you to thank for that. So thank you very much and um, have a wonderful Sunday. Thank you. Also, um, nec uh, next Sunday or for the next three Sundays, we're going to uh, remember those who have passed on ahead of us. And so um, remember to bring a photo of uh, your loved one and we'll have it set up over here. So um, those will be, I, I, I believe, uh, Father Rob said through the 10th. So please remember to bring those. And um, also uh, another note, um, the investiture of our uh, presiding new presiding bishop will be on the second um, Saturday, the second, and uh, it's on Easter time, Eastern time. But you can find a link if you aren't going to go to St. Stephen's, where they're actually going to have a gathering. You can still watch it on your TV at home. Just find the link on there on the Episcopal uh, Church's website. Um, and thank you, Ken and Doug, for leading us today. Uh, is there any birthdays or anniversaries that, um, yes? Grandson. Grandson. Mary? Right. Your son? <laughs> Hillary? Okay. Greg? Way back in the back, I can't see you. Oh, uh, daughter-in-law. Oh, daughter <laughs> yes, Adam? Yes, sorry. Uh, and we have a, an alert for um, today being Kamala Harris's birthday. Oh. Thank you, Adam. Anything else? Anyone else? So we have um, persons in our bulletin, Asa Coleman, and Dan Terry, and Gertie Garner, and then we have the anniversary of Gail and Peter Parkin. So we will say the birthday prayer and then the anniversary prayer together for our, these wonderful people of our, and so gracious God, who made us in your own image, we thank you for life, love, and joy. Send your blessings upon these your children. With the clean things of the day. Surround them with your grace. Fill them with your love. And strengthen them and be your service against the world. We ask the ask of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the anniversary prayer, we thank you, gracious God, for the love and the plenty of the hearts of your servants. And for your continued blessings upon them. Give them kind and loving hearts, always ready to ask forgiveness as well as to forgive. Support them through times of trial, strengthen their love for one another, and may that love empower them to be instruments of God's love in the world. In this we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. One other small announcement is, as, you, as many of you know, uh, Father Rob is not with us today because he is in a production at the Slow Pack called Carmen. And so there's another um, uh, showing this afternoon. Um, you can still got, get tickets at the door if you would like to go. I went there yesterday and it was very lovely. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Thank you. 
to you, O God, for heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. In your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God of all. Jesus stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O God, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament, and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen.
We give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth the people forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Please rise this evil. Deep peace of quiet earth to you. Deep peace of still air to you. Deep peace of the forgiving heart to you. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.